will rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, stand up on your feet. Before we get started in singing songs and worship, we are going to do our call to worship. So let's go. Uh, our call to worship this morning comes from John 15, 12 through 15, and verse 17. I'll say the first verse and then join me on the second. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And altogether, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends, that you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for the, all that you have heard from my father I have made known to you that these things I command you, that you will love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You know what? I don't know about you, but I'm grateful that there's nobody like my God. Are y'all grateful for that? Are I, I know you're ready to worship. Let's go. Clap those hands. Come on. Hey, hey, come on live. Hey, clap, clap. Come on and clap those hands.
Easter service, but our God is still here. He didn't just rise, he got up and he's living and moving. And I'm so, hold on one second, one second. I'm so grateful that we serve an incredible God that is a deserving of incredible praise. A praise. I'm all stuttering Stanley. Deserving of an incredible praise. I give you permission today to dance how you want to dance. Shout how you want to shout. Sing how you want to sing to your God. Let's give praise to God. Let's go. Come on. We lift you up, Jesus. You alone are worthy of our praise, of our song.
sweet. Come on, sing it out, y'all. Say, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is alive, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God. You know, this week, had a crazy, crazy busy week, but I was just reminded <laughs> that as we walk through different stages and seasons of our life, right now is we got basketball season and soccer season. That's just one kid playing both sports, praise the Lord. Then we got another kid, we got travel baseball and AAU basketball. And then another kid, pray for me. Y'all praying for me, y'all better be praying for me. And another kid playing soccer. And another kid just being three years old. That's enough, amen? And so as we're walking through this season, and sometimes we have some great days that are just like, yes, we didn't have practice, praise the Lord, right? And then we have those days on top of doing regular work and regular life and being irritated at who didn't take out the trash, right? You have those seasons where you can, life can feel overwhelming. But we're reminded in the word of God with so many different stories, right? When we look at Abraham and we look at Isaac and we look at Moses and we look at Mary, we look at all these different stories of people that had also regular life that they were going through, but they serve an incredible, incredible God. And, and because they had God with them, everything was always gonna be okay. And so I'm just reminded in this week as I'm reading my Bible and, and reading and remembering certain stories that at the end of the day, we serve the same God of the Bible that we read that split the seas is the same God that cares about all of my needs. Can we celebrate that if you believe that's true? Come on, let's continue to worship that same God. Come on, hands raised all over this place. Thank you, Jesus.
you heard your children you hear your children you are the same God sing it church you are the you answered prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same God you are the same through the ages faithful even when we are unfaithful you are faithful when we run away you chase after us God when we were wondering you're right there so we thank you for the peace thank you for the joy of our salvation alone that you took on all sin bore that cross just for us We thank you. God, we thank you for that time that we had in worship, Lord God. And we're excited, Lord God, for the word of God. And we pray that we don't just hear it or just write it down, but that it penetrates our hearts, transforms us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're grateful for a good God, can we give him a great praise? Come on, if you're grateful for a good God, somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Name. Good morning, everyone. Feel free to sit down. Good morning. My name is Tommy, and we are so glad that you're here with us this morning or tuning in live from wherever you are. We are Redemption Church, and we are a Jesus centered, multi ethnic, multi generational, disciple making church, and we exist to connect people to Jesus and to one another. So, in light of that goal, if you are new here, we would love to get to know you. And you can help us with that by scanning the QR code that's gonna be on the seat in front of you. If you scan that form, a code, sorry, if you scan that code, a form will come up and you can fill out details about yourself like prayer requests. And you can be sure that someone on our staff will actually read that and pray for you. But don't worry people at home, we have not forgotten about you. If you go to redemptionsf.com and you click on the new tab, you can also find that form there. So the main thing is that regardless of whether or not you're here in person or watching at home, we would love to get to know you and to get you plugged into the life of this church. But for the people who are here, if you've never been to our connection desk, which is in the lobby, please be sure to stop there um, after church, greet the person that's there, and be sure to pick up the gift that we have planned in advance for you to have. 
Okay, so now I'm going to run through the announcements that we have for this week. The very first announcement is an exciting one. Um, we're going to be having another creative meetup with our very own Ron L. Roberts hosting, and it's going to be at his studio in Hunter's Point Shipyard. Woo, yeah, I heard that woo in the back. Thank you. Um, this is a meetup for anyone who enjoys expressing themselves creatively, and we're going to discuss how we can use our creative abilities for God's glory. And so the plan will be to meet at Ron L. Studio at 2 p.m., next Sunday, April 13th, and if you are interested, please register in advance for that. Okay, the next announcement has to do with a coming family day. So our next family day is gonna be on Saturday, April 20th, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Presidio Tunnel Tops. This is gonna be a great chance for the families in our church to connect, so please be sure to bring a picnic blanket, be sure to pack a lunch, and join us for that. There also are gonna be food trucks nearby, so if you forget to pack a lunch or don't have time, you'll be good. Uh, but be sure to join us for a time of connection play. And once again, be sure to register in advance so that we know that you are coming. Okay, so our final announcement has to do with a coming Newcomer Connect. And so for those that don't know, Newcomer Connects are a meeting that we have about every two months or so for the new people in our church to get together, to know one another, and also to get to know the staff and to hear about the vision of the church and ask any questions you may have. So come with your good questions. Um, so if you're interested and you're new to the church, uh, be looking out for that. That's going to be on Sunday, April 28th, sorry, Sunday, April 28th, after our second service. And be sure once again to register in advance on our website. Okay, so I think those are the announcements that we have for this week. Um, but if you have forgotten all that I've said, don't worry, you can find it all on social media. We have an Instagram and we also have a Facebook. And that's where you can stay abreast of all that is happening in our church. Okay, so I think that's the announcements for today. And now it's time for our giving moment. So this is actually an opportunity to partner with us and to sow into the work that we are doing as a community in San Francisco and beyond. So there are actually a couple ways that you can give. The first way that you can give, they're actually on our screen, but the first way that you can give is physically by going to the cedar box in the back and dropping off a donation there. But this is also San Francisco, we are a digital city, so you can also give online or give by even texting. And so, uh, let's see, I'd like to invite you all to join me in reading this prayer together as we give. Are we all ready? Okay, let's go. Generous God, we don't give because you make us. We don't give because anyone else is watching. We give because we are grateful and because we want to be a part of the work of your kingdom in every way we can. Generous God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, at your table we present this money, a symbol of the work you have given us to do. Use it, use us in the service of your world to the glory of your name. Amen. Cool, thank you all for citing that with me. And as we continue in worship and as our kids start making their way to Redemption Kids classes, be sure to get up, move around the room a little bit, greet the people that you know, greet the people that you do not know. And a question that you can ask them is, do you prefer cats or dogs? Or do you, like me, prefer the Nickelodeon TV show, Cat Dog? Either or. <laughs> okay, but let's do this. Let's have fun. Thank you all.
morning, Redemption Church. Let's be real, there's only one right answer, right? It's dogs. We live in San Francisco, guys. I see all of the dogs around. Who's really a cat person? It's all right. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm neither because my kid is deathly allergic to both. Um, but hey, uh, welcome everyone to Redemption. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nate. I'm one of the pastors here. And man, just so thankful to, to see some of you, especially new faces. Um, how many of you guys were actually with us this past weekend as we celebrated Easter? Can I just see a show of hands? Woo! Yeah, uh, <laughs> I will say um, Easter is kind of like the Super Bowl for pastors. It's like the one Sunday that you mark the whole calendar around. And so I'm feeling I'm feeling a little bit tired, guys. But I will say Easter was such a blessing to be able to celebrate the resurrection with you all, to remember what the gospel is all about. And so if you are new and you maybe found us last weekend because you stumbled into our doors during Easter service, I want to just encourage you to stick around, get plugged into our church. We are here. 52 weeks a year. It's not just Easter. Um, and I just want to, yeah, encourage you to get plugged into the church. Um, with that said, um, would you all just uh, join me in a word of prayer as we kind of turn to turn our attention to God's word today? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much um, for the chance to gather as a people, as a church. Um, God, I pray that we would never take it for granted the ability to come into this place and to sing songs of praise to to freely and and um, to to boldly be able to sing about a God who is not dead but who is living and and um, to be able to to be encouraged encouraged by one another and to sing these songs and hear these words of truth um, over us I pray that as we uh, turn our attention to your word father that you would have something to say to each of us I know that there are some in this room who are at this moment probably feeling very far from you. And yet, God, you are like the father and the prodigal son. You long to draw near and to run and wrap your arms around those who are far. And, and, and at the same time, those who may feel like they are very close to you, I know that you also have a word to speak to us that we would see even more uh, to a greater capacity of your love towards us. I pray that um, you would use even a weak and foolish vessel like myself to communicate your truth to us, that we might leave this place being changed and being transformed and conformed into the image of your son. And so, Father, I pray that you would uh, work powerfully, that you would speak to us, that we wouldn't hear the words of just a mere man, but we would meet with the living God today. We ask for your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So before we actually turn to our time in God's word, I want to just do a quick shout out to um, our men's fellowship hike, which just, which, which just happened yesterday. Any of you guys go? Can I see? Yeah, awesome. All right. So yesterday, uh, a bunch of, look at this group of good looking guys, single ladies, there are some good looking guys here at Redemption. Uh, but yesterday, um, you see this group right right on the screen. Um, these are guys that gathered together, hiked, I heard something like seven miles in Pacifica. And then they uh, went to a brewery. We'll keep that on the DL because it's church. But they went to a brewery, got to just hang out, fellowship with one another, connect on a deeper level. I'm so sad I missed it. But I do want to just let you guys know that here at Redemption, we're going to try and plan more things like this for guys to get together for the ladies to get together and really the heart behind that is that you know the church isn't just about what happens on Sundays but we want to create opportunities where you can grow deeper in connection with one another and so anybody who missed it don't worry we're going to have more planned in the future and we hope that you'll make it to the next one um, with that said, let's turn to our time in God's Word. Today, we actually get to kick off a new teaching series. Um, in the month of April, what we're going to be doing is diving into this countercultural teaching series where for four weeks, I think the heart behind this sermon series is that we believe God has actually called Redemption Church to be a kind of countercultural community here in San Francisco and even specifically here in this neighborhood. 
that to be a church means something and that we are called to do and we are called to be certain things that God calls us to do and be. And so over these next four weeks, we're going to talk about some of our relationships with one another. We're going to talk about our mission, what we're called to do in this city. And, and hopefully for those of you who are maybe new to church, um, that that maybe you have this question of what does it look like? What does it mean to actually be a part of a church? To not just come to a Sunday gathering, but to actually be a part of Redemption Church. We're hoping that over the next four weeks, you'll get a picture of what kind of community we feel like God has called us to be here. And so um, it's my privilege to kick off this teaching series. If you guys have your Bibles, would you meet me in 1 John chapter 4? 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to read for us uh, verses 7 to 21, and then we'll dive in. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 21. This is what God's word says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in the world, in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. I want us to sit with the thought today, countercultural love, countercultural love. You know, one of the things that I love about my role as a pastor here at Redemption is the chance that I get to meet, connect, grab coffee with newcomers and visitors. I love grabbing coffee with, with some of you. I'm sure I've done it with some of you in this room. And, and I especially love connecting with those who perhaps don't have a background growing up in the church. They don't have a concept of church. And maybe Redemption is the first church that they've ever visited or attended. I, I particularly remember meeting up with a guy a few years back and as uh, he, he found our church, kind of stumbled into our church, and after his first visit, um, I got the chance to grab coffee with him. And as we talked, he had a lot of questions for me about the church. Um, and, and really, these questions that he started to ask started to kind of give me an outside perspective on things that I think can oftentimes become commonplace for those of you who are like me, where we've grown up in the church and, and we're always around the church. And so as we talked, he would ask me questions like, so Nate, what is up with the singing? Like, why do you guys sing on Sundays? Or, or he asked me questions like, what is up with communion? What is that all about? Or, or he asked me, hey, I heard something about community groups. What is that? Do you guys like meet in someone's home and then just talk about your feelings and talk about God? And after talking with him for, for some time, I remember getting to a point in the conversation where he essentially asked me, okay, Nate, but what is the church really about? Like, I think what he was trying to get at was boil it down for me. What is, what is the one thing? Why, why do Christians care about the church so much? And what is the point of everything 
that you Christians do together. I think that conversation has always kind of stuck with me because it made me realize that oftentimes for many of us who are in the church and for Christians, the church can become sometimes a complicated thing. It, it almost feels like this machine with so many moving parts because I know that there are so many different ministries that we as a team are always calling you guys to be a part of. There are so many places that you can get plugged in and, and different activities to be a part of. But I think if we had to boil it down, I wonder how many of us actually know what the church is really about. Like, do you know what it means to be a part of a church like this? I think the passage that we just read, it would seem to answer that question with the answer of love. That loving one another is really at the heart of what the church should be all about and what we should be known by. Even Jesus in John 13, 35, he says to his disciples, by this, all people, I think he's talking about the world, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, that you are the church, you are Christians, and it's if you have love for one another. And, and so that's what we're looking at to, to, together today. That's why we looked at this passage, this idea of what it means to love one another. And if you have grown up or been around the church for some time, um, I'm, I'm probably, uh, I, I would safely assume that this is a familiar passage for, for some of us, right? This is one of those, what I like to call, things remembered passages. Do you guys, do you guys remember that store? Things remembered. It's, it's a, I don't know if it's still around, but it's a store that was in uh, those things that we used to visit called shopping malls. You guys been to a shopping mall recently? But Things Remembered was this store where you would go to engrave things or personalize things like a necklace or a Bible or whatever it was. And, and the passage that we read, I think, has within it multiple verses that Christians love to stamp or engrave on things like necklaces and mugs, or they'll make it a picture and hang it in their house. Verses like verse 7, beloved, let us love one another. Another. Or, or verse 8, God is love. Or verse 18, perfect love casts out fear. Or perhaps the most famous verse, verse 19, which is we love because he first loved us. Like, like do you guys see 1 John 4 is like a best hits of Bible sayings on love. Do you notice how many times John uses the word love in these 14 verses? He uses it 29 times. But see, what I want to do today is help us to see that John is, I think, talking about a picture of love that I'm not sure many of us have. Really, it's a countercultural kind of love because this is Christian love that John is talking about. You have to remember, he is addressing Christians. He's addressing the church. Even in verse 7, he starts out with the word beloved because he's writing to Christians. And in this passage, what I want to do is help us to see what he has to say about the nature of Christian love, the power of Christian love, and then thirdly, the practice of Christian love. First, the, the nature, second, the power, and lastly, the, the practice. And so first, the nature of Christian love. In our passage, I think it's important that we notice that John's view of love isn't some kind of sentimental, warm, fuzzy, feel-good kind of love that I think comes to many of our minds when we hear this word love. In fact, John's view of love, it, it really doesn't have anything to do with human definitions or conceptions of love, but for him, any conversation with love has to start with God. Did you notice that? In verse 7, he says, love is from God. Verse 8, he says, God is love. In verse 10, he says, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. You see, John keeps pointing you and me to having this God-shaped, God-defined understanding of love. And I think John is doing this because he understands that you and I have this tendency to try and define love for ourselves. That so many of us have this idea of what love should look like and what love should feel like. For example, in February 2020, 
Cosmopolitan published an online article. I bet you guys didn't think I read Cosmopolitan, huh? But they, they published an online article entitled, What is the Definition of Love? And, and the author then starts to pull from a variety of uh, voices and sources to try, try to define love. And according to the article, you can see it on the screen, here are some ways that love is often thought of by people in our world today. One person said, love is an incredibly subjective thing. Another person said, loving someone is about accepting them for who they are. Lastly, a person says, being in love causes changes in our bodies as we release dopamine, the feel-good hormone, which gives us a sense of euphoria or pleasure. Granted, I know this article in Cosmopolitan is dealing with romantic love, but I think a lot of the ideas behind these statements actually dominate much of what our society and our culture understands about love in general. That for many of us today, we are here and we have this idea that love is subjective. That love is this feeling of being accepted and valued by another person. And so no matter who you are or what mess you bring to the table, love is, is ultimately about acceptance and affirmation. I think it's why so many of us believe that love is supposed to feel good. Now, in our passage, I think John has a different view of love. That the nature of Christian love is actually much less subjective and more objective. More than that, I think John would challenge the understanding that love is supposed to be something that usually feels good. What do I mean by that? Twice in this passage, John uses the phrase, in this, in this. And what he's doing is pointing us to what love really is and what it should look like. In verses 9 and 10, you see it. He says, in this, the love of God was made, made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Again, you see it, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Do you see what John is saying? He's saying that in this is the clearest picture of the nature of Christian love, that God not only sent his son into the world, which shows us that love is actually about self-sacrifice, but that it's God who acted. He had to initiate. He took it upon himself to work out a better future and an, a better outcome for those that he came to love. Verse 9 says that God worked so that you and I might live through him. Verse 10 says that God initiated so that we might be forgiven of our sins. And that term that Jesus became the propitiation of our sins simply means that God did something. He worked in sending Jesus as our payment. This is what we celebrated this past Good Friday, that God sent Jesus to be the one who would take the penalty of our sins upon himself and die in our place. So again, do you see what John is saying about love? That for God, who is love, love didn't start with us accepting him. In fact, Romans 121 says that we did the opposite. We rejected God. And for God, love couldn't have felt good when he watched his son die in our place. No, for God, love was all about his own self-sacrifice to work out a good for us, even when it cost him everything. See, friends, that's the nature of Christian love. That's the clearest picture of love. This picture of being so committed to someone else's good that you are willing to take everything bad upon yourself to make things better for someone else. I think I've used this illustration before, but, but I believe that kids of immigrant parents— like me, my, my parents were immigrants. Kids of immigrant parents, we actually understand this view of love uh, a, a little bit better because this is precisely what our parents did for us. 
You see, many of our parents who came from other countries, they, they left successful businesses, respectable jobs as, as doctors or business people, and then they came to America, and, and they took jobs as dishwashers or cooks or in the service in industry, jobs where they got very little respect, where they dealt with a lot of racism, and, and they worked themselves to the bone. Now, why did they do all of that? It wasn't for their own future. It wasn't for their own comfort. They had that in the countries that they were from. But they came to America believing that their work, their sacrifice, the money that they were trying to save up would actually offer their kids a better education, a better future, a better career. You see, it was never about them. The decision to immigrate was driven by this, my life for my kid's life mentality, my life for your mentality, that I'm going to live, I'm going to sacrifice myself, I'm going to give up my good and my comfort so that someone else can have something better. And friends, I understand this is a view of love that sounds beautiful and noble and it's admirable. But consider that we're here today to, to see that there's very little benefit to the one who actually chooses to love another person in this way. This is why I said that to John, love isn't about some good feeling. And, and Christians, we have this call to understand that because we've already received this great love from God, that we're the beloved ones. He, he sacrificed his son for our good. Now the call is for us to love one another in the same way, with the same kind of my life for yours kind of love. That's what Christian love is all about. John, John gives us the clear call in verse 11. He says, beloved, if God so loved us, if God loved us with a my life for yours kind of love, we also ought to love one another. And so can I simply ask some of you today, do you see the other people in this room? Do you see the people in this community with this kind of love? Do you love anyone here with this kind of love? Like, are you so committed to their growth and their good that you would be willing to sacrifice for them? Sacrifice your time, sacrifice your resources, sacrifice your comfort, not with this expectation that they're supposed to thank you and give you something back, but because you have come to realize that God has loved you extravagantly, that he has given everything for you, and now he calls you to do the same for one another in this community. See, that's the nature of Christian love. But the second thing I think we need to see in this passage is the power of Christian love. You see, in verses 12 to 21, John turns to this idea of us abiding in God and God abiding in us. He keeps repeating that word, abide. You see it in verse 12. He says, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Again, in verse 15, he says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And then again, you see it in verse 16. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. That word to abide in the original language, it simply means to remain to stay in, to be connected to. It's this picture of abiding, of staying in God's love. Why is it that John shifts gears to start talking about abiding in God in this passage that seems to be a, about exhorting us to love one another? I think it's because John needs to point us to the power that you and I will actually need to love one another that the love that we're called to show one another is actually impossible apart from God's power and Jesus's love coursing in us. Because here's the reality, if you and I try to do this, to try to have a my life for yours kind of love for one another, and we do that apart from abiding in God's love for us, man, we are all gonna hit a breaking point. We're all gonna get to this place where the cost of loving someone else outweighs the call to love someone else. After all, think about the call to love one another as God loves us, not as the world loves us. It's not a love that merely accepts and affirms you, but then leaves you where you're at, because you know what? That's not what God ever does with his children. 
God doesn't accept us as we are and then leave us where we are. He doesn't leave us in our ongoing sin. He doesn't leave us in our brokenness. No, what does God do? He first chooses and accepts us, but then he commits himself to walking with us. Not only that, God continues to do the work of loving and forgiving and bearing with us as he seeks to transform and sanctify us, even when our own transformation and sanctification is going slowly or it's long and it's difficult. But see, transformation is always what God is after that his love would be so big and so powerful a force in our lives that we actually start being transformed and start being conformed into the perfect image of his son. The, the, The heart is that we would actually start to become agents of love and agents of transformation for one another. I love how the commentator I. Howard Marshall puts it. He says, a person cannot come into a real relationship with a loving God without being transformed into a loving person. And so what I think this means, this call to love one another just as God loves us, I think it means that at times, man, we're going to have to confront and challenge one another. I think this should look like Christians in the kind of countercultural community where sometimes we actually speak hard truths to one another, not to condemn, but always to call each other back to Christ. It might look like you going to someone in your community group and having this tough conversation where you say to them, hey, I know that work has been crazy for you lately. And believe me, I get it, work is important. But I also notice you haven't been coming out to our groups. I notice I haven't seen you at church. And so I'm coming now to you because I am concerned. I'm concerned that, that you're only prioritizing work and you're not prioritizing God in this season. I got to ask, is, is work becoming an idol and is church becoming dispensable at the altar of your work? Maybe it looks like you going to another person and saying, hey, I notice a lack of peace in you lately. Like when me and other Christians talk to you in church, we see that you're you're really anxious. You've been complaining a lot. And and did you know that God hates complaining? It's actually a, a serious sin in the Bible. What's behind that? What is behind your complaining? Where is the trust? Where is the gratitude towards God? Or friends, even with topics that I think are taboo or untouchable or uncomfortable in other circles, John is saying that Christians are to love one another in a way where we're supposed to even go to those places. Places like money and politics and sex. That we're going to ask each other tough questions like, hey, let's talk about generosity. How are you pursuing generosity? How are you doing justice even in your personal finances? Let's talk about tithing. Have you been giving to the church? Or or who have you been dating? Who have you been sleeping with? And do you know what God's word has to say about that and about your sexuality? Again, these are tough questions. And it's not meant so that we would be nosy or that we would turn around and gossip or that we would shame one another. But I think these are the kinds of questions that God calls us to ask each other and to get into each other's business because we are actually supposed to be the kind of community that God is using for one another's growth and transformation. Friends, I get that this kind of loving confrontation is tough. Even me, I'm like a little bit hesitant to say that this is what we should be doing because many of us probably feel like these things really aren't anybody else's business. We don't want people getting in our business and some of these things, so we shouldn't be getting in other people's business, right? More than that, I think some of us think, well, what if what I say actually offends someone else? What what if I don't say things the right way, my questions come off in the wrong way, and then the other person, even though I'm trying to love them, they start questioning my intentions, my motives. What if people start to think less of me? To that, John says, well, look at your heart. When you have those thoughts, when you have those fears, are you actually being driven by fear or by love for your brother or sister? See, because fear will always make you more focused and concerned with yourself than you are for a brother or sister. 
Love is what drives you to be more concerned with someone else, with their ultimate good, even at the expense of yours. But fear always causes you to feel like you have to protect yourself. I think this is why John says to us in verses 18 and 19, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. See, I think that's a word that you and I need to speak over ourselves when that fear creeps in. In moments where maybe loving someone in this community and seeking their good is going to cost you something, and, and it's kind of scary to do that. It's this word that says if you and I would simply abide in God, if we would remain and remind ourselves of the love that God has already shown us by sending his son to die in our place, that's when we realize we have all the power and all the love to start actually loving one another. It's when your identity and my identity is so firmly fixed in Christ that we actually start to operate out of love and not fear for one another because we each know that we have already received the love that matters most. And that's not necessarily love from one another, but it's love from the God who created you and knows you. And so even when I seek to love you, and, and I don't have the right words, even when I seek to love you and, and maybe you it goes unnoticed or it's not appreciated or it's misunderstood. I think I'm actually getting to experience what it's like to pursue and to love you the way that God first loved and pursued me. Friends, I want you to hear me say today that there is something supernatural, there is something countercultural about Christians truly loving one another in the church in these ways. There's something deeply profound about Christians who were once strangers and now they're saints together in the same house, continuing to show up for each other now, continuing to pray for each other, continuing to commit themselves to one another, to, to setting up meal trains when someone's sick or when someone has just had a baby. There is something countercultural about people forgiving one another when hurts and misunderstandings start to creep up. I'm telling you, this doesn't happen anywhere else because it doesn't happen unless it's God's love who's, which is at work. I like how Mark Dever puts it. He says, in a local congregation, the fellowship as a whole is to display the holiness of God through its holiness. God's love is to be reflected in the love they show one another. The unity of God is to be reflected in their own unity. You see, what Dever is saying and what I truly believe is that more than offering the world airtight arguments, more than offering them theology and more knowledge about God, perhaps the greatest testimony that the church and that we as Christians can offer an unbelieving world about the power and the love of God is actually through our love for one another. It's through our unity. That's the power of Christian love, and that's what we're called to as a church. The last thing I want to do is just help us to look at the practice of Christian love. How do we actually practice this kind of love towards one another? You see, John, in verse 20, he says this, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God, whom he has not seen. See, John is trying to get practical here. He is saying that, you know what? Loving God and growing as a Christian isn't rocket science. You want to know if you love God? Just look at your love for the church and for your fellow Christian brothers and sisters. Do you love the people in this community well? Because that is a good gauge of your love for God. See, many of us, I think we have to stop thinking that what God values the most in a Christian's life is whether or not he or she is reading their Bible and doing it consistently, or whether he or she is attending church or praying. Those things are important, but, but do you see that in passages like this, God has made it crystal clear what he cares about most, and that's whether, you, whether or not you and I are actually growing in love for one another, whether we're actually practicing love towards one another. And so as we strive to do this, as we pursue moving towards one another in love, I want to just offer us three practical principles. 
The first is this. I would say be committed to one another. Because the truth is that love without commitment is impossible. Like if the people that you see around you are simply people that you're okay seeing when you see them, and you're okay seeing them when it's convenient for you, but it's not a big deal if, if you don't see them, man, it's going to be hard for you to have any love for anybody in the church, at least in a meaningful way. This is why the Bible continually uses terms like we're a household, we're a family, we're a body, because there has to be a sense of connectedness that goes beyond convenience for us. See, when we're committed, when we prioritize one another, when we care about what's going on in each other's lives, not just on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, John says that's powerful. Because that's actually a way that you are pursuing an unseen God. And so I want to encourage some of you, whatever greater commitment might look like, maybe it's a small step today. I want to encourage you to take those steps. Sign up for a community group. Serve on a team. Grab coffee with someone here. Whatever it looks like to start moving in the direction of love towards the people here. Start moving towards greater commitment. The second thing I would say is be bold in speaking truth. In John 17, 17, Jesus prays this prayer over his disciples to God. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. You see, if we are actually for each other's growth and for each other's good, knowing God's word and speaking God's word is how we actually spur and cheer each other on towards growth. And so for the brother or the sister in this community who is currently struggling with anxiety, love is ready to, to preach a word like 1 Peter 5, 7 over them that says, cast your anxieties on God because he cares for you. Or for the person who is struggling with pride, love will meet them with Philippians 2, 4 that says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. For the person who struggles with shame and doubt here, love is ready to proclaim Romans 8, 1 over them, saying there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? That if we care about each other's growth, then the more that you and I know God's truth, the more that we can speak it boldly over one another, we're actually encouraging each other's good. Lastly, I would say, speak the truth always in love. This is a call to check your heart before you offer any truth. Check your heart before you offer anything to your brother or sister. See, we're not called to be the kind of community that beats one another over the head with truth. But in all things, in all ways, in all words, we're to be driven by love for one another. I'm realizing more and more these days that as a parent, what I think about most is my kid's future. I'm always thinking about what kind of men my two young boys are going to be. And, and because I'm thinking about their future, I, I realize I talk to them a lot. Like I am capitalizing on moments where I can teach them lessons on what it means to be a gentleman, you know, to open the door for mommy, what it means to be confident yet considerate, how to protect one another and protect those who need protecting. See, I'm always thinking about their character and using my words to to help teach them lessons. Basically, I preach at them a lot. <laughs> like, like you all think, I'm sure, that I talk a lot up here, but feel sorry for my kids because they have to put up with it every day. But see, understand, it's out of love for them that I talk so much. I want them to grow up. I want them to, to know how to navigate life, and so I'm passing on these words, these lessons and truths to them. But friends, I'll tell you, there is something powerful about those moments where I just hug them, where I wrap my arms around my boys and I remind them, hey, I love you. I'm already proud of you. There's a way that my boys light up when they see their dad on the sidelines cheering for them after they make a shot or score a point, after they paint some painting or learn some new skill. And it's those moments where I realize I'm not just there to give them truth. My love is a powerful thing that is actually helping them grow and develop. My love lifts them up. It reminds them who they are, that even though they are still works in progress, that they're still growing up to, into the men that they're one day going to be, that their dad loves them and he is for them. 
And friends, that's the kind of love that I think we're called to have for one another. We're supposed to be for each other this reminder that we are already loved, that we have a heavenly father who sent his son to die in our place, to live the life we couldn't live, and then to die the death that we deserved. And, and it's when we love each other that we remind each other, hey, you are already secure in who you are in Christ. And you are secure because you have this family that is cheering you on, looking out for your best good. This is why the church is such a powerful thing. This is how we reflect the love of Christ and the unity of Christ to a watching world. And so I want to encourage you to start seeing this community, seeing this church as a gift seeing it as a way that you can pursue an unseen God. And as you start to make small steps of love towards one another, I am confident that we are going to be the countercultural community that God calls us to be here in San Francisco, that we're going to forgive one another in a countercultural way, that we're going to speak up in a countercultural way, that we're going to pursue each other, accepting each other, but also spurring each other on to greater growth. And I know that as we do that, people are going to see Jesus as this beautiful thing, and they're going to see this community as something that they need to be a part of. And so I encourage you, I exhort you, move towards the direction of love, because our God is love, and, and just as he has loved you, we ought to love one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the gift of the church. God, I thank you that you have not called us to live out this faith in isolation and to figure out all of our questions about who you are and the life that you call us to live in isolation, but that you give us an actual family to work these issues out in. Father, I pray that Redemption would be a church that's not just known for good music and, and for an, an exciting place to be on Sundays, but that we would be known by our love. That, that people would see that there is a, a deep love that is at work amongst us. It's what causes us to go after each other. It's what causes us to be committed to each other. I pray that our love would be so attractive that it would start to, to point people to who you are, that they might find true life, that they might find true love in you and in the gospel. And so God, give us the, the power and the wisdom to love each other in these ways pray that your spirit would convict our hearts out of self-protection and out of self-love, that we might start moving towards one another in the way that you called us to. We ask for your help, and we know that you'll do it. So it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Powerful word. Come on, let's stand up on our feet. We're going to sing this beautiful hymn about the amazing grace of our God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but
move into a time of celebrating communion now, and you guys can be seated for this. I want to bring us back to the scripture that we heard today, that this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And what this tells us as we enter into communion is that this is not a time of striving or earning or trying to prove anything to God, but that this is a time of receiving. And it's a time to recognize that the only reason why we can come to this table is not because of anything that we have done or anything that we can do on our own, but it's about receiving what God has done for us. And so as we prepare to take communion, I want us to really take this opportunity to open our hands and open our hearts to receive the love of God and to become so acutely aware of His presence that is with us here and now and to open our ears to hear His voice as He says to each and every single one of us right now in this moment, my child, my son, my daughter, I love you. And there is not a moment in time that I have withheld my love from you. And when I look upon you, I don't look at you with eyes of disappointment or eyes of indifference, but my heart is captivated with delight and pleasure and joy over you. And so I want us to open our ears to hear our Father say that to us this morning as we prepare to take communion and recognize that we don't have any, communion is not about anything that we can bring to the table, but it's about opening our hearts and opening our hands to receive the love of God that is expressed to us through the atoning sacrifice of His Son. You know, scripture says that before we take communion that we ought to examine ourselves. And so this is something that we do not on our own, but it's something that we do together with the Lord, where we not only confess and repent as needed, but in turn receive the love and mercy that God has available for us in this moment. So we have the elements that are prepared at the tables up in the front for you. Take some time and really engage with the Lord and sit and be present with Him. And whenever you're ready, you can come up and um, take one of the elements back to your seat and I'll call us back and we'll partake in communion all together.
Apostle Paul tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it, and after giving thanks, he offered it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Let's eat in remembrance of Jesus' broken body. In the same way it says that Jesus took the cup and lifted it up and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink in remembrance of me. Church, let's drink in remembrance of Jesus' shed blood. All right, and now I wanna invite you all to stand to your feet and let's respond to the Lord in worship with songs of gratitude and a heart of praise. My chains are gone, let's sing it. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. An ending love, amazing grace. Let's sing it one more time. Our chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, an ending love, amazing. Sunday, I'm just reminded what a gift it is to be a part of this church, to, to be able to do life with you guys and to, to see the ways that God is moving in our community. And so I hope you would just take this charge with you as we leave uh, today, that as you and I pursue a God that we have not yet seen, that the call is clear that we are to love one another, pursue one another, move closer to one another in love. And so as you think about different ways that you can do that this week. I want to just uh, send you all off with a blessing. Receive this benediction, which is just a blessing to take with you as you leave this place. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the great love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all as you leave. Church, we love you. Have a great Sunday.